I have brought this book, Lola in the Mirror by Trent Dalton. Now, anyone who has listened to anything on the podcast or jumped on the Facebook group knows that Trent Dalton is one of my like top three favorite authors. I love everything that he does. Uh, if you don't already know, he has done uh, Boy Swallows Universe, All Our Shimmering Skies and Love Stories. And Boy Swallows Universe has just been made into the Netflix series. So if you want to check that out, that is definitely a good introduction to his work. But I firmly believe that Lola in the Mirror is his best book yet. It was published late last year and it has already been on a bunch of charts here in Australia. So definitely worth checking out. I will say from the outset that this book has a lot of heavy themes. Um, I'm actually just going to read the author's note, which sums it up better than I can. Uh, Trent's done really well with this, actually, before he even starts. He says, many of the events in this novel were inspired by stories told to me by the people I met on the streets of my city, which is Brisbane, across 17 years of social affairs journalism. Some of these events involve violence, addiction, and self-harm, which some readers may find distressing. But those same people I met in the street also spoke of community, hope, and love. And that's why I wrote this book. So if you are not ready or you don't like reading uh, books with a lot of heavy themes, it does have a lot of strong language as well. This one may not be for you, but I gotta say it is absolutely brilliant. My first impressions of the book, um, this is a really unique uh, thing about it. This book is actually interspersed with drawings. So it's not a children's book by any means, but the book actually starts with an artwork. And when you turn the page, the artwork has a plaque with uh, the name and the published date and a description like you would in an art gallery. And we soon realized that the main character, this, this girl is the artist and these are her drawings. And her one dream is to have an exhibition at the Met in New York after she dies. She wants this posthumous exhibition uh, where, you know, everyone knows her name and everyone gets to talk about her life and her, her suffering and her tragedy as basically this arc for a brilliantly artistic life. And this is the way that she kind of escapes her reality. She sometimes imagines uh, that all the bad things happening in her life are simply going to be something for someone else to reflect on in a hundred years and marvel at it, her works. So I really love that because we see about 20 or so of these drawings throughout the book and we actually get to see as readers the story unfold in a slightly different timeline because it's almost like foreshadowing events that happen and we don't really know. Yeah, it, it's quite bizarre, like, um, I guess, telling the story in the future a little bit. It's, it's really cool. It actually does help move the story along as well um, because... I will say my one gripe, my one gripe with the book is that it does have some pacing issues sometimes. And it's like, oh, there, there were moments where I'm like, it was very easy in the first probably like 100, 150 pages to just not pick it up again. Like it, it reached a natural point where it's like, oh, this is really going to have to, something's going to have to happen here. When you reach that points in books like that, do you abandon them? Or oh, are you gosh. a bit of a... No, I I persevere. I hate yeah. abandoning books. Me too. I, I've abandoned a couple over the years. Oh, but, do you want to name and shame? Do you even remember um, uh, A Martin Cruz Smith book, mm -hmm. uh, which was a spy Cold War thriller. Uh, there was one more recently, but I can't even remember what it was. I just got into it and I thought... It's terrible. Yeah, can't do it. No. I, I was all, I was the same, I think, as you. Um, I really don't like... I'm a bit of a, you know, type A perfectionist personality. you got to see things through to completion. But also I have this, like, fear of, like, there's only... I'm only going to be alive for, like, 80 years and I'm not, not going to be able to read all the books that I want to read. So, like, why am I wasting my time? So there's just, that just situation. Just to depress you a little further no, about that. Don't say that. Even if you could read... 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you couldn't read all the books you wanted to read, let alone the ones that you might be interested in. <sighs> now, you're a young person, so you've got plenty of years to read, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this has just made me sad. All right, I'm going to keep moving on to the things that I actually really loved about the book as well. Firstly, the setting. I am not a big settings person in a book. Setting versus characterization, I'm all about the characters. If I don't like the characters, I'm out. Mm. Even if it has a brilliant setting, I can't, I don't know if it's because I don't have a super visual, vivid imagination. Like I can imagine things in my mind's eye, but I'm not like, it's not like a movie scene when I'm reading a book. I, I don't know really what I'm imagining 
half the time. So if I can't connect with the character, I'm not going to connect it's with the brilliant setting. It's, for me, it's characters yeah. as well. I think you've got to engage with them and like them or relate to them in some way. Mm. And I think that really hooks you in. Visuals, settings are great. If you've been somewhere, that's good. Mm. I think that helps. But I'm with you, a good character, an engaging character that is integrated into pushing the story along as the way to go for me too. Yeah, 100%. So I think the characterization here is brilliant. Immediately, you are drawn to this main character. You don't even know her name. Generally, that's the identifying factor, right? But you just want things to work out for her. You, she's just had such a hard life and you're like, if you just hang on a little longer, a little longer, a little longer, maybe your luck will turn. So I think she is just instrumental in moving this story along. Also, all the side characters pretty much, uh, except for the, you know, the really evil ones that you, you that are just monsters. So many of them, Charlie, this girl's best friend, um, this girl's mum, who we only really see for the first, you know, 50, 100 pages. So many of the other uh, houseless people that live in the scrapyard, Roz and Serge are just, they're so great. Um, and I think what this book does really well um, and I think this does come from Trent's um, background as a journalist. Uh, it shines a real light on homelessness or, or houselessness as the, the main character like to refer to it because she's like, I'm not homeless, I have a home, my home is my family, you know, my home is my art. But most of the characters in this girl's life are, are homeless and are invisible to the rest of society. In fact, that there's, there's this scene where the girl is walking along in peak hour traffic and they're in the middle of the Brisbane CBD and there's just people rushing past her and not even noticing her. And she screams into the void, I am invisible. And no one stops and no one even looks at her. And it's just, I found that so poignant because, you know, homelessness is just such a growing issue um, in, you know, all major cities, regional areas, just throughout Australia. But just, I think it made me stop and think it's like how many invisible people, how many people's stories just are known by hardly anyone who we walk by each and every day. That was a really kind of, yeah, just something that I really took out of the book. Um, and Trent not only gives them a voice, but he gives them the voice. They are the main characters in this book and we are invested in their stories. But he also doesn't shy away from the, you know, the, the roughness, the grittiness of homelessness. Um, you know, this girl to survive is a drug courier for, a, you know, a character in Brisbane's underworld. You know, there, there is just so much that a 17 year old shouldn't have to deal with. Uh, one of the characters has been on a waiting list for housing for four years and no signs of getting off the list because there's just not enough accommodation. Uh, they even talk about the Brisbane 2032 Olympics in here and they're all starting to plan and the scrapyard gets sold to a company that's gonna tear it down and build athlete accommodation. And you just think, what? How is that more important, temporary two week accommodation than having a home for these people? And you just think this, this stuff happens every day. This is the kind of thing that is happening every day. So that was definitely a challenge for me. Um, have you read a book like that that kind of challenges your perception of like those real life events? Uh, yeah, I read um, last year a book called Black Man, White Law, mm. and it's all about the plight of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians who live in um, the Northern Territory and how they're dealing with a law that just has them on the back foot time and time and time again. It was very confronting and reading that leading up to the vote on the referendum and that I just it's just so out of my realm of experience but I think this is Australia this is yeah. part of Australia that most of us will never deal with yeah, yeah. So, so important and I, I I found that similar kind of thing here it's just so out of realm for so many of us and yet yeah. it's everywhere That's it is correct. so many people's reality um, I want to finish up this recommendation by, by a little message that we can glean from this book as Christians. Um, I think ultimately I just took from it that everyone has inherent value uh, as humans. You know, we are, are born in God's image, every single one of us, and uh, each of us have a story and God cares about each of every single one of us. And I think that should be enough for us to care about our neighbours. Um, we should do everything in our power to to love our neighbor, whatever that looks like. And simple acts of kindness, you know, 
we're not going to be able to solve the homelessness crisis, if, you know, one person. But single, single acts of kindness can make a difference. There was this uh, one shop in the book, this Indian takeaway shop, that every night gave away their free food. After 9 p.m., um, houseless people could come and they'd be given food for free, no questions asked. And there are characters in the book that quite literally relied on that to survive because they had no money. Things like that, things that we can do in our own life that, you know, don't have to be revolutionary can really change someone's path and change their journey. So that's uh, what I took from the book. Uh, in terms of who I would recommend it to, obviously it does have heavy themes. So if that's not your vibe, probably don't read this one. But there are a couple of Facebook uh, comments of people who had already read it uh, that I want to read as well. Lauren saying, I found parts of it challenging had me really thinking about houselessness and how some people in society have many privileges and advantages and others don't. Really loved the main character and I kept reading because I wanted to know that things would work out for her. And honestly, that's what kept me reading as well. Um, and it does have a very satisfying ending. Sue saying, I thoroughly enjoyed it. There were many confronting themes, but the characters were so good. It was really believable despite being out of my own experience. Uh, I had really trouble, had trouble putting it down. I have recommended it to so many people and I thought it was even better than his other two novels. So that is who I would recommend it to, Lola in the Mirror. <laughs>